This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Hi everyone, welcome to phase 17 of the Man Carrying Thing universe. I make a lot of silly um, videos and whatnot, but did you know that this channel started out making book stuff? Well, I still do that, and no one's gonna f stop me. I don't know why I was aggressive with that, it's not that serious. First, I'm going to talk about the big series I've been tearing through, talk about my experience with that. Then I'm going to talk about some of the other books I've been reading. Then I'm gonna try out a new segment uh, called Book Mail, which is heavily inspired by Mr. Daniel B. Green, and I'm very grateful for anyone who sends me anything at all. Anyways, the books. So in another video, I talked a lot about the Parker series, and I think in that video, I had only gotten through the first five or six well, I have been tearing through those, especially in the month of March. The Parker series is a series of books by Richard Stark, AKA Donald Westlake. Hard-boiled crime fiction, begun in the 60s and ended in the early 2000s. I mean, there's 24 or 25 just Parker books. And I hope that through my reading of them, I'm getting others to read them because they, they should not be overlooked. In the crime genre, in the classic noir uh, genre, they really stand out. Westlake as a writer really shines in these books. It may seem like they would recycle things. And the Parker series does in a way because they're all typically heist stories but and heists that go wrong and whatnot but they typically follow the same structure but it's kind of like a classic it's like a classical music bring new depth to the characters to the situation put parker into increasingly more perilous situations and how to keep it grounded and real it's incredible and part of what makes the series so fascinating is figuring out the limits of parker's capabilities you know he's this brilliant, skilled thief, cold-blooded killer. He hardly seems human. He's like an alien. Part of the suspense of the series is figuring out how far his empathy goes, you know, how human is he? And it's always fun. So I read, of course, The Score, one of the best books in the series. Parker number six, The Jugger. I enjoyed The Jugger quite a bit. It's not a typical heist thing. A lot of the book, you're kind of going, what the hell is even going on? Parker's trying to figure, Parker's behind on things. And it's very funny because people keep approaching him and are like, hey, are you in on this thing? Like this heist, like, I know you know. And he's like, he has no idea what's going on, but he plays along because he wants to figure out what everyone's going on about this $100,000 and everything. Um, and also like a creepy depiction of a, a small town cop great villain. I mean, part of what keeps the Parker series interesting are these fantastic villains that he brings in there. Before we get on to the next book, I do want to talk about Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity with Skillshare. You know, a lot of people ask me questions about uh, building an online presence or, or creating videos and content and, and trying to start like a business out of it. And I have such little advice for for that because I feel like I stumbled into this. But I have found some actually very helpful uh, courses on Skillshare I do want to share. Discovering Success, Seven Exercises to Uncover Your Purpose, Passion, and Path by Emma Gannon. I, I found this one applied a lot to what I've learned over the years now doing YouTube. I also enjoyed Productivity for Artists, Organizing Yourself for Success by Brooke Glazer. I have a really hard time with organization and hitting deadlines and etc. etc. So I found this a nice refresher. You might know Skillshare for classes in photography, film and video editing, and illustration, but did you know that Skillshare has hundreds? of career-focused classes too. Traditional jobs are not one-size-fits-all. Learn how to design a career to fit you. 2023, that's the year to reinvent your goals and yourself. I find myself browsing the website constantly, finding new stuff I want to do. They've been a fantastic sponsor for this channel for quite a while now. You can do it in bite-sized videos or watch the full course. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads. They're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused. Skillshare now offers classes in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. The first thousand people to click on the link in the description get Skillshare for free for one month. It's a fantastic deal. Do it, learn something new. All right, now we're going back to the books. Then there's the seventh, which to me, the seventh is probably my favorite in the series. Terrific ending, just great pace. It's one of those Parker books where the heist goes horribly wrong and they're having to hunt down someone, you know? And um, then The Handle, which is the eighth book, uh, I didn't enjoy quite as much because it seemed more like a setup for a spinoff series, the Growfield series. The Handle, like a, an espionage story. And I, I appreciate the variety because there is variety in the books. I like getting to see Parker as like a James Bond sort of character, except he's way more evil. <laughs> I won't say evil, but he's, he's way more like, um, doesn't care about anything um, except for just doing the work and getting the job done. He is the apex of the Protestant work ethic. It is kind of like outlandish. I honestly thought it was a little thin. I thought 
it could have felt a little more believable if it was there was a little more, you know, to it. But it was entertaining nonetheless. I do have it currently as my least favorite Parker book, but I still enjoyed it. So that says something about how much I love the series that my least favorite book, I, I think is still a, a pretty good read. Now at this point, Westlake uh, changed publishers. He moved to Pocket Books, I believe. Or no, he didn't move to Pocket Books. He moved to Gold Metal, I think. I like when, whenever he changed publishers, he always kind of had to change for the market. And I liked seeing the development of these stories as they kind of fit in with like the realities of the publishing industry. All very slim and very fun reads, but this run is known for the, the score books. They're they're known for their kind of humanizing. They look at Parker. There's, there's more humanizing stuff, and people, some people dislike this part in the series because he becomes more human. I disagree. I just think that there's more of that suspense of Westlake asking, "How far can I?" push Parker towards empathy. How human is he, you know, and, and testing him in these different scenarios. For example, the first of the score books, Parker number nine, the rare coin score, introduces a love interest, Claire, who ends up being his companion basically for the rest of the series. She goes in and out of the books. The rare coin score didn't love. It was fine. It just felt a little dry. There was no great villain that I enjoyed that much. Then the Green Eagle score is fantastic. There's even scenes where like a therapist is trying to understand this Parker character, you know. Everything goes wrong in a, a brilliant way, but um, they rob an Air Force base. It's great. One of my favorites, the Green Eagle score. Then we have the Black Ice score. The Black Ice score is interesting because it involves like the politics of an African nation and they're trying to steal a certain diamond because there's these nationalists. And so there's like some more, sort of like the handle and sort of like the mourner. There's some political intrigue going on. I thought the book was Pretty great, actually. This one gets criticized a lot. I didn't like that Claire was sort of just a damsel in distress and her stuff wasn't as fleshed out. By the end, Westlake was trying to just wrap things up super fast and I wasn't super into how it ended. It just felt a little rushed or whatever. Or maybe I was just done with the book by that point, but not one of the best, but also not horrible. And then the last of the gold medal uh, editions is uh, the Sour Lemon Score. I heard this one was really good, so I bought it in paperback, and it is good. It is another one of those uh, heist situations where things just get worse and worse. Nothing goes well. There's some homicidal killers in there. Parker has to hunt people down. There's so much driving. Like, Parker's just scrambling always one step behind. He gets drugged, you know, kind of bleak and to the point. And I love it when Stark slash Westlake goes there and just sink into the, the grime. Uh, I mean, that's what I love with noir and that's what I love with these Parker books. Sometimes there's more of the, of the fantasy, but this one felt very down to earth and gritty. And I like that. Then uh, just recently at the 13th Parker book, I've read the 14th one, Slayground. I talked about that another time. Slayground is fantastic, by the way. But the 13th Parker book is called Deadly Edge. This is when paperback originals were sort of collapsing, not collapsing, but they weren't as popular. So Westlake switched the Parker series into hardcover and you feel that sense. I mean, it's it's a longer book. It's more fleshed out, fleshed out and it feels like a reintroduction to new readers reading maybe the hardcover. The first act is fantastic. It's all just one chapter. Most of the books are split into just four parts. The first act is just a wonderful heist of a, a rock concert. And I really love this because it's 1971 and things are starting to change. I mean, Parker is like a character character from the 60s. He's more like a character from the 30s in a way. The opinions about like rock concerts in the 70s and the counterculture was very funny, felt very um, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Claire, Parker's partner, is, um, you know, kidnapped by these psychotic, uh, drug acid taking hippies who portrayed as totally unhinged. And I, I thought it was really fun. It, I, I thought the writing was really strong. Deadly Edge was good. So yeah, that's the Parker series. I'm, I'm continuing to read it. So the next ones are Plunder Squad and Butcher's Moon. And then there's like a 25 year gap before he picked it up with a uh, comeback. Besides Donald Westlake, I'm sorry, I, I can't help it sometimes. I've been reading so much Donald Westlake. Um, I read a wonderful self-published book called Seasons of Albedon, completely different from hard-boiled noir fiction. This was a fantasy story. It was sort of like a collection of four stories or novellas. It was a short book. Really surprising. I heard good stuff about it online. I actually had a chance to meet the one of the authors. I thought that there was a nice kind of um, fable quality to it, but it also it leaned into the darkness, you know? There, there was a 
a kind of um, lesson in each story, but it, it it wasn't all about that. They are loosely connected, so it creates a whole. There is a sequel that I plan to read, and it's longer. It seems more like a, a, a novel than the first one. If you want to get into a really quality self-published, I mean, self-publishing industry, I mean, sometimes you'll find writing that isn't super polished. This was quite polished. I had some issues with the writing, sort of slow in some places, but regardless, it, it ended up capturing my imagination. There were some really fun scenarios like world building wise and I really got to care for the characters in a way that you don't always get with short fantasy stories. Yeah, it's a really promising series so I'll let you know when I read the second one. Then I read and just finished Cat's Cradle. Kurt Vonnegut, I picked this up at Goodwill. I have only read Slaughterhouse Five, and that was years ago. I was in high school. I have very vague memories of Slaughterhouse Five, but I just never got into Vonnegut. I honestly think I was too young and wasn't able to appreciate like the the humor, the political humor. Cat's Cradle was genuinely funny. Like I I laughed at a couple points, and I would never do that when I read. Super clever, but it, it you know it has this Vonnegut has a way of writing that's super so much is packed in there. It's very dense, and the characters feel sometimes one-dimensional, sometimes more than one-dimensional, three-dimensional, filled with ideas and humor, and Vonnegut has such a cynical view of humanity, but is able to appreciate appreciate it at the same time. It, it was very, um, it made me happy. I don't know how what other way to put it, even though it is a book about like the end of the world, but also a product of its time, the 60s. The female characters are not fleshed out at all. Very dated, uh, you know, racist uh, stereotypes. and But, you know, factoring in the time it was written, it's it still holds up and has a lot to say about the present world. Uh, Cat's Cradle, I, I recommend it. Really liked it. <laughs> Finally, I'm going to loop back around to Donald Westlake and talk about 361. It is one of his earlier novels that he wrote under his own name. Before he wrote under his own name, he wrote uh, like uh, softcore erotica. But uh, 361, I was captivated by seeing an image of the original cover. Really a precursor to the Parker series. The main character is, and I'm pretty sure he wrote The Hunter the same year, but you feel like this is a preview for The Hunter. The Hunter is more bleak. And, and and Parker is a more intense character, but this one had a really kind of sad, interesting dynamic with like fatherhood and trying to find your identity. I think you the more you read Westlake, the more you find out how a lot of his books are about identity and self-knowledge and figuring out who you truly are. So there's like universal themes there. And this was a like mafia story um, before The Godfather like popularized a lot of stereotypes we have about the, the mob, like hard-boiled, very hard-boiled and um, pretty violent book. Um, and a lot of like tragedy happens in it. An easy book to read. I mean, it's it's very entertaining. You want to know how it all unfolds. I will say I thought the ending was a bit anticlimactic. Bloody cover and you hope it's going to end in some kind of massive gory bloodbath, but it was a little more restrained. Uh, I did enjoy it quite a bit. On to our next segment. This is something new called Book Mail. Um, I'm just going to be talking about the stuff that people have sent me, you have sent me. Reminder, the P.O. box is in the description of this video if you ever are inclined to send me your book or someone's book. Appreciate all the notes and everything. So, Every Imagined Tundra. I have read a couple of the poems. I haven't read the whole thing, but really like it so far. Thank you for sending me this. I'm not going to share anyone's names, you know, for whoever sent me things, but um, this person sent me a really lovely uh, note in a book that I haven't heard of, but sounds really interesting called Have, Have, by Jan Morris, which is like a experimental science fiction something. It, I mean, it's it's something very interesting that I really want to get into with an introduction by Ursula K. Le Guin. So I'm very interested. I love, you know, the New York Review of Books series. So this author, Jules Polarski, I've heard of this writer on Twitter or something. So when I saw this, I recognized the cover and I'm really into the style of this book. It feel, I think it's like choose your own adventure sort of thing. And it looks really fun. I'm going to read this soon and I'll let you know what I think of it. One of the first books anyone has sent me it was called, uh, let's see, Guardians of Eranor Rebirth. In the book, they sent me a screenshot of me replying saying I'm going to read their book. I thought that was really funny. <laughs> so I'm definitely going to read this. I mean, some of these like self-published books, they have really high quality covers and whatnot. It's, it's really fantastic. This one is from a small publishing press, I believe. This sounds really interesting. I, I started it and I'm really into the vibe. It's, it's very well written and kind of um, a surreal way. There's like an ima this imaginary Eastern European 
country and the city and these expats living there and their their friendship and um, it has a kind of um, fun zany energy that I'm really vibing with so I I look forward to finishing this another author reached out to me and um, told me about their book and I said yeah please send it this is called the evening hero just barely started it and I do uh, plan to finish it soon from what I know it's about a Korean doctor there's some dark past um, it's been receiving a ton of praise and I, I look forward to getting it so thank you for sending that. I really hope I'm not forgetting anything. This is just from the last few months. Thank you so much to everyone who sends me anything, a note, a, a book. I mean, I love discovering new self-published books. I'll um, get to them when I get to them. So thank you everyone for that. I hope you enjoyed the book mail section. I already opened them. I wasn't going to wait and open them on camera. Sorry. I don't have the self-control for that. Once again, thank you to my patrons for supporting the channel. Always. I mean, you guys are um, so lovely for, for doing that. And I also want to thank Skillshare, of course, for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to click on that link because it, it's a like a really good deal. Yeah. So that's what I've been reading. What have you been reading? Tell me what you're up to parasocial friend let me know what stuff i should read i promise i am going to read warbreaker i'm reading it now <laughs> there's just a lot to read also i'm finishing the dark tower soon i promise all right i think that's everything thank you all for watching and i will see you all uh, soon bye bye